Despite independence, many Hereros still live in these infertile areas of Namibia, while descendants of their white oppressors still own the best land. Are you optimistic as you look forward about your future in Namibia? History has its cause. It doesn't really help much when we cry and referring back to the past. And of course, we must make use of our independence and make use of the opportunities that are coming up. Turn so negatives into positive. <laughs> It was time to leave Namibia and follow the tropic across the Kalahari to Botswana. Thank you very much. Right. So you keep that bit and I keep this. Yes. Am I free to go? You are free to go sir. Thank you very Thank much. You Any questions? Good. Is there an in-flight meal? Nope. The peanuts in the back. The peanuts in the back. <laughs> But while the Namibians were happy to stamp my passport on a car bonnet, Botswana is a very different place. It's better than some schedule airlines. Before embarking on our epic journey across the Kalahari Desert, we had to fly to Gaborone, the capital, to sort out government paperwork. Oh, we've arrived. Welcome to Botswana. I don't know if you can see the sign that's just above me. It's just quite interesting. It's an anti-corruption sign. Um, corruption is such a huge problem in Africa, but we're told that it's actually quite low in Botswana. Botswana is rated as the least corrupt country on the continent. In Africa, wealth from natural resources has too often left the country or lined the pockets of the ruling class. But here in Botswana, there has been a huge investment in public buildings and infrastructure. The secret to this success can be found here, at the headquarters of mining company Debswana. A third of this former British colony's wealth comes from a girl's best friend, diamonds. Where are the, where are the biggest diamonds on this floor? Biggest diamonds on this floor. I met Dust, who works on one of the sorting floors. These are the plus eight. Plus eight eight carats. Carat. Let's do the count first. Let's okay. see this, uh, this two, four, six. There's no dispute on the number, is there? I haven't no. taken any. <laughs> you haven't touched the name. My, my hands are here, right? <laughs> <laughs> A person could get tempted in here. Am I right? I think the best way of still telling whether a diamond is a diamond or it's a piece of glass is to scratch it along the glass, is that true? There, 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 there are so many things that you can do. Well, you're an expert, Das. What, what would you do? Well, my, my, I, I can even know that when I'm with my, my, my eyes closed. Your eyes closed? I, yeah. I've been what can you do? You can, you, you can I smell them. I can just them. feel it and smell them. It's a real diamond. So they should just send you out to hunt for the diamonds, then? You, they could why, use why, you. Why, why, why not? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be able to discover new deposits. <laughs> no. Das would just smell them. Yeah, no, especially not. with the big noses. <laughs> What I think I am smelling? I'm smelling money. Money. This is one of the eight sorting floors. So elsewhere in the building, there's, uh, there's yet more workers and lots more rocks. Apparently you need to check the soles of your feet before you leave. Sadly, there's nothing caught in mine. Then you are Thank you, Dust. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. To see where the diamonds came from, I headed to Juaneng, just outside the capital. This is a 24-hour operation, seven days a week. Albert Milton is one of the pit managers at the world's biggest and most valuable diamond mine. My God. Well, so this is the most lucrative hole on the planet. In terms of value, $2 billion. $2 billion yes, a year? Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. are making, from this whopping great hole in the ground, $2, $2 billion, billion dollars a and year. That's really where the dreams of the country come from. The, the impact has been really awesome. I mean, if, if you were to look at uh, this country, at independence was uh, classified as one of the poorest in the world. 
there was about four kilometers of, of, of roads. Now we're talking about over 20,000 kilometers of, of roads. There were no health facilities. I mean, each major area in, this, in, in Botswana has got a hospital now, has got a school. Debswana, the company which runs the mine, is a joint venture between the government of Botswana and international mining giant De Beers. In a continent where the trade in so-called blood diamonds often fuels war and conflict, this deal is seen as an ideal model. But in the late 90s, the mine faced catastrophe. Southern Africa's HIV epidemic started to decimate the workforce. With almost 40% of the population of Botswana carrying the virus, Debswana moved to protect its workers by investing heavily in healthcare. Well, this is the, uh, the clinic. And even as we're walking up to the clinic, we're finding a lot of people hiding their faces. It's extraordinary that in a country where the, the rate of HIV is so high, there's still a complete reluctance to admit it publicly. In 2001, Debswana took the revolutionary business decision to provide its workers with free antiretroviral drugs. And now they've extended the scheme to spouses and children. We do have some of our clients this side. The, these are Mena. clients? Yes, yeah. We're Hello, coming everybody. To access, access their medication. That's so the these are clients coming yeah. in yeah. to receive medication? Yeah, that's the pharmacy. Dr. Nzenza explained to me that in a continent where AIDS drugs are beyond the reach of most ordinary people, the diamond workers are in a fortunate position. But clearly Debswana is not acting out of charity. For a company to start offering retrovirals to their employees, it seems, it seems, almost, it seems quite unusual to me. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, the company has to be able to survive. And uh, the operation has to be actually viable. And for it to be viable, it needs to have a fit workforce, which is one of the things which really drove it. Following the lead of Debswana, the Botswana government has now extended the free treatment scheme to all public sector workers. The death rate from HIV AIDS is finally beginning to fall, but it has left 120,000 orphans across the country. I went to a charity that helps the youngsters with Lucas, a local journalist. Hello everybody. Good morning. Hello. Hello. How are you? Oh, the little one just burying a head. What's, what's the name of this one? Defo. Defo? Defo! <laughs> You're going to shake hands with Lucas? Oh. Hey! <laughs> yeah. SOS Children's Village teaches the orphans alongside kids from local families. The orphans live in houses which try and recreate the atmosphere of a family home of up to 12 children, with a mother figure in charge. In the morning, I bath them and make them breakfast. I encourage the older ones to become independent, showing them how to make their beds and how to wash themselves. It is difficult to overstate the impact this disease has had on this region of Africa. Not only has AIDS destroyed a generation here, a couple of generations, but it's destroyed the extended African family, which is one, was one of the best things about African society, really. The idea that your aunt or your uncle was also sort of your mother and father. But because so many people have died here, that structure has broken down and it's led to a need for places like this. It was time to head for the Kalahari. Botswana is more than twice the size of Britain and is dominated by the vast expanse of the Kalahari Desert. I was heading to the small settlement of Nuzade on the edge of the central Kalahari game reserve. The Kalahari Bushmen, or sand people, have lived in this desert for more than 30,000 years. Their current plight has received worldwide attention. So this is the uh, this is the settlement. 
In 1997, the Botswana government began relocating the few hundred sand still living within the game reserve out of the national park. Many were given compensation, including cattle and goats, and settlements like Nuzade were created for them. But many of the sand insist they were forcibly evicted. Hello, sir. Talk about BBC. When, when did you come to live here and why did you come to live here? It was 2002. It wasn't my intention to come here. We were forced. Is there anything about the town that you would miss if, if you go and live in the, back in the central Kalahari? The thing is, there is nothing to miss from here. What you see here is temporary. I belong in the central Kalahari. The only thing is for me to go back, nothing else. I will miss nothing from here.